So brothers and sisters, I come before you this morning with great trepidation, honestly. This is a, uh, a departure. We are definitely a gospel-centered church. We are a gospel-driven church. And trying to meet the body, to meet the culture, to help us walk together in the spirit of peace, the bond of peace, and in unity and in love, this message was born out of that great love. It really was because there's other people that, that are associated with our body that we're trying to describe to me why their vote for things that God hates was justified in their life. And it really became this passion that I was concerned and I wanted to speak clearly to it. I wanted to help us all get on the same page of primarily a, a few thoughts. And one of the main thoughts I want to just place out there before we get going is this. If you wake up on Wednesday morning and you have any less joy than you did on Tuesday morning, you probably have idolatry in your heart. Meaning, you don't see the sovereignty of God absolute. Your hope is in man instead of Christ. And all sorts of implications that flow from that. So I want to speak to that a bit today. But I want you to have that in your heart and in your mind. Because your election will inform the upcoming election. Amen. So I'll be reading two pieces of scripture to get us going. The first section is out of Jeremiah 18. Many of you know the text. And I'll be reading a portion of John chapter 8 with a focus on just a couple of verses that we can rally around. So brothers and sisters, I ask that you please stand for the reading of God's word. If at any time I announce that a nation or a kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation I warn repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. And if at another time I announce that a nation or a kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good that I had intended to do for it. Once more, Jesus said to them, I'm going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. This made the Jews ask, will he kill himself? Is that why he says where I go, you cannot come? But he continued, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. And I am not of this world. I told you that you will die in your sins if you do not believe that I am He. You will indeed die in your sins. Who are you, they asked. Just what I've been telling you from the beginning, Jesus replied. I have much to say in judgment of you. But He who sent me is trustworthy. And what I have heard from Him I tell the world. They did not understand what he was telling them about his father. 
So Jesus said, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases Him. And even as He spoke, many believed in Him. To those who had believed Him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are truly my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Then they answered him, We are Abraham's descendants. We have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we be, shall be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. I'm telling you what I've seen in the Father's presence, and you are doing what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If Abraham were, if you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did no such thing, and you are doing the works of your own father. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God has sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father the devil. And you want to carry on your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. Not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God, hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. May God bless the reading of His Word to your soul. You may be seated. There's a weighted truth in that text. It's so extraordinary. It's so overwhelming. Because the battle that Jesus was facing is the battle that you and I face every single day when we walk into this world. It's a battle against truth versus the lies of this world. In the heart of the matter is this. We all believe the lies at one point. We were all born under the wrath and judgment of God. We we're all born in Adam. So brothers and sisters, I want to remind us of the gospel. I want to remind us of the truth of the complete gospel and then come to this text and let God speak to our souls very clearly about the hope that we truly have. You see, we share as the people of God true joy and true hope. And we share in the Lord as the extraordinary truth of God revealed to man. 
And we as a gospel-centered church are unashamed of this glorious truth, of this glorious gospel. We open the word, we preach it boldly, we rely on the Spirit of God to bring conviction to our spirits, to our beings, to bring us closer to Christ. Being a gospel-centered church, we preach the full counsel of God. We have the privilege of opening the Word, studying it, and bringing it in its fullness. I say that because there's too much in the church culture today where the verses that would be troubling to the wise of the world are somehow glossed over, not dealt with, not spoken of boldly. So the gospel starts with God. It's God's gospel. It's His revelation to man of all that He has done. In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. He is the creator of all things. He had given Adam basically two commands. And those commands were broken. They were not obeyed by Adam. And Adam, as our federal head, as our representative, as none in one of the commands to be fruitful and multiply had occurred yet. All people were born since Adam and Eve with the sinful nature. Adam and Eve inherited it by their disobedience, and you and I are born in this problem. We have been separated from God by our original sin, and we have acted out that sin so perversely and this world continues to, those who do not know Christ continue to, and sadly, we as Christians also sin. The devil had entered the garden, had tricked our spiritual father, and as Paul would say to us in Romans 7.11, that sin is a deceiver. It's a liar. It promises one thing and delivers another. And Adam understood that very, very clearly. So we're born with this rebellious nature of God putting us under His wrath and subjecting our bodies to death. The idea of eternal life is not a New Testament idea. The tree of life was given in the garden. It was from the beginning that we would live in unity with God forever. That was broken. But God, as our Creator, in His infinitely merciful judgment, decided that He would redeem a people from this world that were His very own. A called out people. A people that would be changed in both heart, mind, affections, understandings. Given hope by the truth revealed in the Word. Given a different direction of life. A peace that passes all understanding and a hope that goes beyond the grave. You see, there was nothing that God could have given Adam to do to redeem himself before God. And that's a very critical point for us to understand because it will come up later when we talk about salvation versus sanctification in how we make decisions and how we function within those two spheres. So to satisfy the, the law of God that was broken, God devised the plan that He would send one to crush the enemy's head. And He would execute this plan by revealing to mankind the ones made in His image a book 
that would reveal who he was, what he would do, what he would accomplish, what's going to happen, what things, how things are going to look in their life, what they're going to be in the future, and in a most peculiar way would describe to you everything about life you need to know to give you and I hope, to give us a purpose, to give us understanding and meaning to this life. And that plan would satisfy holy justice. That plan would satisfy the wrath of God Almighty. So God executed this plan. He, Jesus, was born of a virgin, according to the Scriptures. He lived a sinless life, according to the Scriptures. He did God's will perfectly, according to the Scriptures. He went to a cruel and humiliating death on a cross to fulfill the Scriptures. He was dead in a grave three days, according to the Scriptures. And He walked out with a glorified body, a resurrected body, according to the Scriptures. Most gospel presentations sort of end there in the glorious good news that Jesus was resurrected from the dead and gave us hope beyond the grave. But here's the complete gospel. He ascended to the Father at Pentecost and is now awaiting the day where He is going to come back in fiery judgment and justice to wage war against all of His enemies. This is a fundamental picture. Number one, that we're rejoicing in the table, lifting the cup until he, we're proclaiming that he would come back and make everything right through his wrath. When he comes back, there's no hope for his love or mercy on the sinner. They're lost. They're eternally gone. There is no hope at all. Brethren, that's the truth of the gospel. Because you see, it's the love of Christ that draws us near and dear that one would take the punishment in my place to do such an amazing thing for such a wretch as I. But there's also this picture of this great day that's also to keep us on this straight and narrow path that we will be judged. That we will be called to account for our words, deeds, and actions. And we'll make the distinction now. There is this salvation of God, and it is all of God, and it's only of God. He is the one that opens the ears. He opens the eyes. He opens the heart. And that's what Jesus is getting at in this text. God alone is the one who does these things. It is our privilege to respond to this truth and live as though our life depended upon it because it does. You and I want peace. We want hope. We want meaning. We want joy. We want all of these things. And they are found nowhere but in the gospel and truth and person of Jesus Christ alone. Peter would encourage us this way, where he says, in the truth of this picture that I just described to you in 2 Peter chapter 3, he gives us this very intense warning where he says this, he says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed in the fire. And everything done in it, every word, deed, and action of this world will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, brothers and sisters, what kind of people ought you to be? It's a rhetorical question. It's a question that begs our mind's engagement to say, ah, what ought we to do? What ought we to be? What, what's coming? What is this about? Why am I here? It, 
And we have those answers. And Peter tells us the conclusion. You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God. This day of Jesus coming back in judgment. And speed its coming. That day will bring about the destructions of the heaven by fire. See, this is a weighty picture. It's a, it's a, it's a very aptly described picture because it's not new. Again, Isaiah spoke of it. Jeremiah spoke of it. The, the, the entire Bible spoke of this coming day. As Paul says in Romans 2, God will repay each person according to what they have done. So, the truth that I just revealed to you of the gospel, the truth and the scriptures that we just heard describes exactly how Peter starts his letters with the encouragement from heaven above to God's elect. The people of God. The people that have heard this complete gospel. The people that tremble at this day that will come where God will judge this earth. And I'll just say it one more time if you're not convinced from Revelation 19 there's going to be a mighty warrior where I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him riding on white horses, dressed in linen, white and clean, and coming out of his mouth as a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is your God. This is our Master. This is our Leader. This is the Mighty One who will lead us in triumph procession. I want to lay that heavy upon our souls this morning because, you see, there is a response that comes from our actions to move forward in an understanding that our words, our actions, and our deeds will be judged by this great and glorious God full of power, full of glory. He will do all that He pleases. And no one will hold back his hand and say, what have you done? This is our God. And he is awesome. To God's elect. The ones that are now privileged to have ears to hear. And eyes to see the lies of the world. The deception that's set before all mankind. Let me give you just a... Bit, I believe it's perfectly clear in Scripture of the eschatological events that will happen. We just heard that as we're rushing forward, there's going to be this great day of judgment. But between now and that day of judgment, when you read through the revelation to mankind, things do not get better. Do not be surprised at the fiery trials and ordeals that you will go through. That's Scripture. So do not be surprised when we see people organizing around a party that believe that there is no God. They are an enemy of God. When there are people that organize around and try to defame and deform the purpose of of marriage which God designed two men in a bed is not a marriage and two women with a child is not a family this world can jump up and down and say all they want to say it is a lie from the devil
that God made man in his image male and female. And to distort the image of the creation is pure evil. You cannot change your gender. It is a lie from the pit of hell. And when you have a group of people that rally around truths, when people rally around lies that go against the truth of God, they must be rejected. Jesus' words are clear. Because you are unable to hear what I say, you belong to your father, the devil. You want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. You see, I'll stand here at this pulpit until I drop dead, and we will boldly proclaim the truth of what God is, who he is, what he's done, who we are, and how this world is rushing to distort all that God has said. Because God has established us in His nation, the picture that comes out of Jeremiah is a helpful picture for us. And this is where the people of God must Learn to come before God and before the people of this world and call this world to repent, to turn. You cannot look at this nation in its establishment that you would have basically a bunch of farmers beat the world's largest superpower and say, yeah, you know, because they were smart or it, it, you, you cannot believe in the sovereign hand of God and think that's even possible. The truth is God has established this nation. He sent men to come here to establish a Christian nation if you look at the Mayflower Compact and how we are actually established. And we are richly Christian in our foundation. And we'll see that in the quote for the week. But this nation who mur has murdered 90 million in the womb points its bony finger at the Nazis and can't believe it. Disdain. Yet, what goes on every day in this nation is an absolute abomination. You read through the Old Testament, the scriptures are replete of kings sacrificing their sons in the fire to appease their fantasy gods. Yet this nation does it on the altar of pleasure every day. The judgment that will come upon a nation that murders the innocent, which God hates, is extraordinary. Be prepared that this nation would lose its blessing before God. But, be hopeful that our hope is not in the nations. That our hope is not in any particular person. Because be very clear, we believe in the sovereign hand of God. We believe in a God that knows all things and does all things for the glory and purpose of His will. The election is settled. So if you wake up, like I said, on Wednesday morning with, can't believe it, believe it, believe it. You know, it, it is a peculiarity when you look at church history because there is a very rich saying that was true. It's true. It was true because of evidentially true how it produced itself. But the the, the, the church was watered by the blood of the saints was the statement. You see, we, we, we run around anxious about the left and the right knees and nose and this and what's going to happen. He might need to bring wicked, wicked rulers on this land to bring his church forth in glory. 
See the purposes of God in whatever the answer is. Find rest and peace with others that are finding rest and peace. Jeremiah would reveal that to the children of Israel often, two places. Peace, peace, they say out there, but they have no peace. The only peace you can have is from Jesus Christ, despite what we see. You see, being founded in a Christian nation causes us to grasp truth. And this is where the truth sets us free. And this is where the truth that we have to grasp, and this is the truth we need to share with our neighbor, that it takes wisdom that comes from outside of man to speak to man. If law was of man, of culture, of time, season, or place, then it's going to be fluid. It's going to change rapidly. And no one can actually determine right or wrong, good or evil. Because if it's man who's determining it, you've heard me say this many times, tell me why the Nazis were wrong. Tell me why Stalin, murdering 30 million as an atheist, why is he wrong? If man is what the world says he is, he's just a, a biological accident with no meaning or purpose. Tell me why I'm listening. And they always steal my worldview to try to explain purpose and meaning, which they cannot. Their illogic is depth defying. And we, again, I'll say that. I say it once, I'll say it a thousand more times. We are the people of peace. We are the people of truth. We are the people of mercy and understanding and glory and goodness and all the benefits that we receive in Christ to go forward and to share that. To help people understand they can enjoy this also. It's calling out to God in prayer. They would save their souls. We're not, we don't thwart the election picture of God. However, we also believe that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If they truly turn to God in repentance in their heart, God looks upon that soul and saves them by his private counsel. The secret things belong to God and we will absolutely follow his will this way. So we rejoice. We rejoice in the picture of this election first to our souls. I want to talk about that for a minute because this comes out of our doctrinal picture. It's in the bulletin. I want to bring us to that place again in humility where we see this truth about our souls. You see, to those whom God hath predestined unto life, he is pleased in his appointed and accepted time effectual to call by His Word and Spirit out of the state of sin and death in which they are by nature to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ. Enlightening, opening their minds spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God. Taking away their heart of stone Ezekiel 37, and giving unto them a heart of flesh, a heart that beats for the things that God's heart beats for, renewing their will, and by His almighty power, determining them to that which is good, and effectually drawing them to Jesus Christ, yet, so as they come most freely, being made willing by His grace. That is glorious gold to our souls, brothers and sisters. The wisdom and power of God in saving souls is equivalent to what power He used to create the universe, to redeem a man from darkness and change him to light. Glory. See, this effectual call of God's free and special grace alone, not from anything at all foreseen in them, 
nor from any power or agency on the part of the creature who being wholly passive, being dead in sin and trespass, until being quickened and renewed by the Holy Spirit, he is thereby enabled to answer the call and to embrace the grace offered and conveyed in it, so that by no less power than that which raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that power that saved your soul is the same power that's going to take you out of the grave. Embrace that. It's glory. Our election of God is by His plan and by His design. And I want to really... You know what? We, many of us don't sit around reading this little book. But it's a very helpful way of just reminding ourselves of these truths. And saying them to each other. Encouraging each other. Because, you see, that picture of election is hopefully, by the stern warning of Scripture, going to inform us. And I have no doubt that we've been informed, brothers and sisters. I, this is not, like, I believe this body here, looking out amongst the congregation, owns this truth. I believe that. I believe this is an encouragement. I believe this is, is designed by God to well us all up into helping others see the truth, that we would have a voice that would not be quieted by a sinful world that wants to shut us up, by a big Eva complex that thinks that their little system that is not of Scripture is good for this world. Nah, not at all. We reject a compromise to the gospel of Jesus Christ in any way, shape, or form. We reject folly and lies of this world. We come together rejoicing in the power of God to convert souls and give the wisdom and understanding to do what is righteous. So brothers and sisters, this righteousness given to us, is designed by God in our, the sanctifying work of God upon our souls to then go forth and speak boldly about what we say, believe, know, understand, and I'll end it with no is the truth. Unashamed of it. Verse 31 of John 8. To the Jews who had believed him, he said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Brothers and sisters, own that thought in your heart and in your mind. Because we have all been beholden to the party, our lusts, Addictions, our sin, fill in the blank, fill it in. The truth will set you free so that you're not disappointed on Wednesday, so that you don't say the things you might have ought to say, so that you don't go to those places. So it's the truth, the truth of God revealed in the gospel that Jesus Christ is Lord and King and is coming back one day. <clears throat> so Father in Heaven, inform us richly, deeply in the truth of our personal election. Lord, that election informing us very clearly Tuesday, Lord, to do what is righteous. To speak boldly to our friends, our families, our co-workers, and our neighbors, unashamedly, that you are King, that you are Lord, that you are coming back, that you will judge this world, and you will be glorified. Strengthen our weak knees and feeble arms, we pray in Jesus' name.